Welcome back again, everybody, to Friday Night Bible Study slash youth group for those of us here in person. Tonight we're going to finish our series that we started a, a number of weeks ago titled, God Has a Destiny for Your Life. And uh, just was mentioning it earlier, there are some times when I'll finish sharing a message, quote-unquote finish, and I just feel it in my heart that there's more to be shared. And I've learned in those times, if, if you're not done yet, then you're not done. And don't move on to something else until you are done. And <clears throat> that's from the point of view of ministry, of course, but there's, you know, even in your own personal devotional time, if you're, if you're studying a book or studying a, a, um, a topic, for example, <clears throat> and you just feel there's more revelation that the Lord wants to share with you, don't move on to something else until you really feel that you've gotten all that the Lord wants you to get. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. Sir, we just worship you. We honor you. We bless you. We thank you that you have us in the palm of your hand. Thank you, Father, that you've given us your word, that you've given us the Holy Spirit, and we trust you. We rely on you tonight to, to be who you said you would be, to be our teacher, to be our comforter, to be our guide, to be our helper, our advocate, our strengthener, our standby. You are our everything, Lord. We trust you. We, we, we place our our faith in you, Lord, for to receive all that you have for us tonight. Lord, we place a demand, not arrogantly, but just out of hunger and out of obedience to your word. You said, ask and you shall receive. And Father, we just ask in faith. We thank you that you have a word for us. You have an encouragement for us. You have a, a, an exhortation for us to receive. And we do so by faith. We just receive it. We pull on the anointing. We pull on the grace of God to receive all that you have for us. Father, we just thank you for the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of revelation, and the knowledge of you. Thank you for helping us to understand what we read and what we hear. Thank you that we never have to read the word of God alone, that you are with us always, and that you're helping us in all of these areas. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if you would, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. As always, if you have a Bible, we welcome you to turn there with us. If you, if you uh, have your device or if you're on the web browser or whatever, just go to Bible Gateway or any of those websites and do your best to follow along with us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9. Again, we're, we're talking about destiny tonight. God has a plan for each and every single one of us. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9 reading out of the New Living Translation tonight, for God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out His anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive when He returns, we can live with Him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. Back to verse 9. God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not to pour out his anger on us. There's a certain way that he words that verse that I'd like to just point out to you. God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not to pour out his anger on us. In other words, it came down to a choice of God's choosing. It was God who made the choice not to pour out his anger. Let's flip it around. Not to pour out his anger on us, but he chose to save us. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. It was his choice. It wasn't our choice. We didn't come up with the idea of, of, the, of the Messiah coming to the earth to pay for the sins of all mankind. That was God's choice. That was God's idea. God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not to pour out his anger on us. What we deserved was anger. Why? Because of sin, because of wickedness, because of unrighteousness. I've mentioned it time and time again. Doesn't We don't need to go over it anymore, but righteousness and unrighteousness, holiness and unholiness cannot mix. They are incompatible. So when, when they come into contact one with another, something has to give way, and it's not going to be righteousness. It's not going to be holiness. It's going to be the wickedness. It's the unrighteousness, the unholiness, the evil stuff caves away to the, to the good stuff. So if there's a person who's sold out to the devil 
and they come in contact with a person who sold out to God, something is gonna. There's going to be a conflict of interests. There's going to be an, a you know, big word, an altercation. There's going to be a, an argument. There's going to be friction. We are incompatible. It's one reason the Bible says, "Be not unequally yoked together with an unbeliever." And of course, that's the context of marriage. But it's more than that. Be unequally yoked with a person who you're incompatible with, spiritually speaking. Not talking about personalities, you know, dating-wise or anything, but spiritually speaking. Jesus said to the Pharisees of his day, Ye are of your father the devil, King James. Speaking to the religious leaders, who, who they went through all the, the right outer things to do. They went through all the traditions, they did all the rituals, all the sacrifices, but their hearts were not in it. And thereby, without the heart being behind it, there's no true faith being expressed. Faith is belief, but faith is belief backed with action. And they had the acting part. <laughs> they didn't have the belief part. And you'll hear it so, many, so much even in our circles that we focus on the, the acting side of faith. Faith is an act. Faith is, a, is an action, right? But it's also belief. If you're just acting with no belief, you won't experience anything. And people in our in our you know, sphere of influence, our circle, so to speak, reign of people, word of faith, people, Pentecostal, charismatic, whatever you want to call it. People in our, in our circles, they hear messages about healing or they hear messages about prosperity and yet they don't believe what's being said. They don't have a real revelation of what's being taught. So they go through the motions and I'll give to this ministry a certain amount and I'll, you know, quote my healing scriptures for the day, but they'll never experience healing, or they, they won't experience the blessing of God, or they will to a certain degree. God can only do so much with what He's given. He is merciful, He's good, and He can take even the smallest amount that people give Him of faith and do amazing things with it. But I don't know about you, but I want to experience all that He has for me. <laughs> so in order to do that, you don't just do things by the book, so to speak. You don't do it wrote or routine, and when I say by the book, I'm not meaning by the Bible, it's just an expression. You know, just putting the bare minimum of effort into it, I should put it that way. We don't just do things for the sake of doing them, we have to have belief that backs up our actions. We have to have revelation that's backing up our faith, otherwise we won't experience what God says we can experience. Verse 10, Christ died for us, so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. That's speaking about the rapture. When he returns, I should say, the second advent, the second returning of Jesus to the earth. Whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. There's going to be a group of people on planet earth when Jesus comes back and he is going to... Purge the earth, so to speak. It's called Armageddon, Hebrew. Apocalypse in Greek. Basically the last battle, the final battle, where Jesus comes with every Christian who is in heaven. They come to the earth riding white horses. And Jesus single-handedly, by himself, he's got all the armies of heaven and every Christian, every believer that's ever lived on planet earth behind him. Plus the remnant of, of believers on planet earth at the time. And Jesus, by himself, rides out on his horse. And the Bible says that like a sword, the word of God goes out of his mouth. And every evil person, every demonic spirit, in an instant, is dealt with. Is taken care of. And the Bible says, it's, it's graphic, but it says that there's going to be blood that comes up to, to a person's knees. It's just, just so much, you know, judgment is coming, so to speak. Payment is payment, Payday has arrived. And we, we, we say, God, where is judgment nowadays? It's, he's delaying it as long as he can. Judgment is going to come. Sin demands judgment. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. There is no getting around that. So it's not God being unmerciful. It's people that have sinned. And they have not accepted Jesus as the way out. There is no other option. <laughs> God, again, holiness and unholiness are incompatible. They cannot mix so when, when Jesus comes back to the earth to usher in his kingdom and to set up heaven on the earth, there's not going to be any unrighteousness there. And the Bible says that spot where the, bottle, where the battle of Armageddon took place, there's never going to be a complete restoration of that area. 
it says in Revelation that there's going to be smoke in that plot of land that's, gonna, that's just going to burn for all of eternity as a, as a sign of this was where the judgment of God finally had the fall. And this is the end of it, and there's going to be no more because it's been dealt with. The enemy has been finally, after so many years, right, been dealt away with, been put away with. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. Verse 11, so encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. The last couple of weeks that we've been here, you know, I've shared testimonies of supernatural experiences that I've had. And I, I'm just, I'm reminded of some things that Brother Hagen said. Brother Hagen talked face to face with Jesus at least nine times, nine times that we know about. There might have been more, there might not have been. I'm inclined to believe there was only nine, because if there was more, I believe that Jesus would have shared some things with him that were meant for the entire body of Christ. You don't just reach his place in ministry and just have experiences that, that are just for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? In a manner of speaking, you do. When you come and you worship God, he speaks to you on an intimate level. But having a vision from Jesus, like he delivers a message, a message for you to give to the church, that's not for you to just hold, it, hold to yourself and, and hold it back. And go to your grave, you know, at 86, 87 years old and not share all that God put on your heart to share. I don't believe Brother Hagin was that way. I believe he shared all that he could, all that he was permitted to, all that he had it in his heart to share, he shared. So that his book, I Believe in Visions, tells about nine, I believe it's nine times where, where Brother Hagin personally spoke to Jesus. And on a number of those occasions, it was a conversation that lasted up to an hour and a half. Where he just sat down with Jesus, and Jesus spoke about his ministry. He, he gave him revelation. He taught him one-on-one. -on -one. And, and Brother Hagin would come out of those conversations, and he would think, God, there's so much in your word, of, in your word that I don't know. I've been studying this for, for 50 years, you know, plus, depending on when you hear his testimonies. He, he had these visitations from Jesus for many years. I think over a period of like 20 years. <clears throat> and it's like, Lord, there's so much in here that I don't know. <laughs> and he, he would say, the more, that I, the more that I begin to know, the more I realize I don't know. Mm -hmm. And there's so much in here that there is, there's just revelation that we haven't even tapped into yet. And that's not a bad thing necessarily. There's just so much to God. We're never going to fully exhaust, never going to fully run out of things that we can learn from God. He is amazing. He is the teacher. That's what he does. He teaches. And if there was no more, nothing left to teach, he couldn't be the teacher anymore. So what does that mean? There's always going to be something more to learn from the teacher, right? It's called eternity. <laughs> we are called to be Christian, little Christs. And that's not just to, to have a good behavior and to go to church on Sundays. That's to be like Christ. That's to be like Him. Who is Christ? Christ is he's the second person of the Godhead. He is God. We're called to be like God. Not in a prideful way, not in a weird way. We're going to be in heaven with Him for all of eternity. And we are, the Bible even talks about it, we're going to govern the affairs of the universe. And the angels are going to look at us and wonder, wow. I mean, we heard the scriptures just as well as they did. We didn't realize it was going to be to this level. And we are going to have the host of heaven at our beck and call, every angel in heaven. You know, it's going to be like, let's go to this solar system and let's do this and let's rearrange the stars or whatever. You know, I don't know what exactly we're going to be doing, but apparently there's, there's stuff that has to happen in the universe and we're going to be a part of it. We're not just going to sit on our, on our hands, you know, and... and fall asleep and take naps and relax on a beach. I'm sure there's amazing beaches in heaven. I heard a testimony of somebody once who, who said they went to heaven. And um, the reason why there's four seasons on earth, winter, fall, summer, spring, is that there is an entire, for lack of a better word, an entire realm of that season in heaven where there's just an entire land of winter, an entire land of summer, of spring, of fall, so that you could do whatever you want that you would normally do in those seasons. So if you're a person who loves the beach, 
there is there is summer land, so to speak. There's perpetual beach, perfect temperature all the time. Or if you like to ski, you like to go mountaineering, you know, sleep in a log cabin in the snow, whatever. You could do that whenever you want. Verse 11, so encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. And I know a lot of it comes down to personal experiences and people, you know, you're going off of what somebody said or what somebody heard. But I can't tell you the amount of times I've read Revelation 19, 20, and 21. It's the, the most detail we get about heaven in the Bible. And if there's anything encouraging <laughs> about the scriptures, it's those scriptures. It's because of what, it's what we have to look forward to. The Bible says, Rejoice that your name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I mentioned that when I spoke on Sunday a couple weeks ago. There is a Lamb's Book of Life that every person on who... Actually, the way that it works, it's not that you accept Christ and your name is put in that book. Every human being that's ever lived has their name in that book. When they die without Jesus, their name is blotted out. So it has the record of every single human being. That's why when he says, that when the graves were opened and the books were, were unlatched, so to speak, because it's, I don't know if it's books or if it's scrolls, if it's seals, I don't know what it looks like exactly, but we're just told it's books. So the books are opened and people's whole lives are brought forth and they have to give an account for what they did with their lives. And then depending on if, basically, if they accepted Jesus or not, it's like they, they go through the register and they check off these names. You're in because you accepted Jesus. Your name is right there. If a person died without accepting Jesus, their name is just blotted out. It's smeared. They cannot tell what that word says. Because the blood of Jesus never entered that person, never cleansed that person. They, they are incompatible. And it's not to be a Debbie Downer, it's just that's the way that it's going to work. That's the mechanics of it. So rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Jesus' blood blotted out my sin so that my name was not blotted out of the book. His blood paid for me to enter heaven, and not just to enter heaven, but to enter eternity, to have heaven on the, on the earth, in my life, starting now. So that I can go through the rest of my days in His glory and His blessing. And then when I happen to, to cross over to the other side, I'm going to be with Him for all eternity. And I don't know about you, but I don't want it to just be such a, such a, a shock when I get there. I know it will be, because the Bible says it's, it's beyond imagination, right? Far above all that you can ask or think. So it's more than we can even imagine. But as far as my relationship with the Lord goes, I don't want there to just be a, a, a big difference because all of a sudden I can see you face to face. You know, my prayer life shouldn't have to change all that much because it's, it's the same thing. I'm talking to Him. It's just going to be face to face. And there's, of course, there's a different perspective that's going to go with this. You know, it, it's undeniable. It's going to be different because it's, <laughs> you're there face to face. But... You know, in an ideal situation, it really shouldn't feel all that different. We're, we're still speaking to him person to person, heart to heart. And we should be able to hear his voice now just as clearly as we will hear his voice then. Back to verse 9. Let's just read this through one more time. We'll move on to the next verse. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us, Christ died for us, so that whether we are dead or alive, when He returns, we can live with Him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up, just as you are already doing. And we talked about this whole idea of predestination a number of weeks in a row. Predestination is not God choosing who dies to go to hell, who dies and goes to heaven. That's, that's, it's your choice. John 3.16, remember we spoke about it two weeks ago. God sent His Son into the world that the world would not perish, but might have everlasting life. God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but through Him, they might have life. They might have life. It's a choice. Without Jesus, there is no escape. There is no salvation. But Jesus came, therefore salvation is available. Now it all comes down to what you do with Jesus. The predestination of it is God sent Jesus. That was predestinated. God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the destination for every single human being 
was chosen. I want you to experience salvation in Jesus. That's why I sent Jesus in the first place. But not everybody's going to be accepting of that. Again, whose choice was it to send Jesus? God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ. If God could work His will in every human heart, there would be nobody going to hell. <laughs> but He can't do that because it's a person. it comes down to a person's free will, free choice. They have to make the choice. And people say, well, what about angels? You know, why, how come God created evil? He didn't create evil. Angels have the same free will that we do. You know, if there's an illustration of this and that would clear it up for people, angels had a free will. Back when Lucifer was Lucifer and not Satan, he persuaded a third of the angels to follow after him. They had a free will. They had a choice to make. They chose to side with Lucifer who became Satan and they fell for that choice. Yeah. If there is good, there's always going to be the opposite of that, which is going to be bad. Like there is, you, you can't be like, oh well, let's say robbing is good, but buying is bad. You know, there's going to be something contradicting the first one is having an event. So mm -hmm. there's always going to be bad. You can't not have it. Yeah. Until, you know, you can put it that way. Until until Jesus finally closes the book on it. Yeah. Until. Yeah, but for now, for the time being, of course, the devil roams about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's going around doing all that he can. That's why verse 11 says, So encourage each other and build each other up, just as you are already doing. We need encouragement on these things. We need building up. Because otherwise, the devil comes alongside and he manages to discourage people. It's the biggest thing in the Bible, is this, this idea of heaven. It's what inspires people to make artwork, to make paintings, to, you know, you look at church history even. What's recorded more times than anything else? You see the ministry of Jesus depicted in artwork and depicted in stories. And you see pictures of angels. What, what, what does this boil down to? You see the supernatural. Because that is what the heart of this thing is. If there is no supernatural to this, then we're just spinning our wheels. And we can't base his word off of anything. We don't know if it's for real or not. But thank God for the supernatural. Thank God for, for the miraculous, for the change in people's hearts. That way we know it's for real. People say, well, how do you know that Jesus is real? How do you know this Christianity thing is for real? Because of what it's done in my life. You know, how, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. It's like going to the gym. And how do you know that that's, that that's, making a difference in your life because you can see results eventually <laughs> right you stick with it long enough and you eat healthy and you get enough sleep you drink plenty of water and you exercise you're going to see results you'll lose fat and you'll put on muscle right it's just simple logic the same thing with christianity how do we know it works because it works <laughs> how do we know that jesus is who he says he is because of the the results of believing in a person's life Jesus lived 2,000 odd years ago. You don't just change the world. And, and man, I've shared this example before, but mankind bases our reckoning of time, A.D., B.C., based on one person's life. You do not reach that level of influence without the supernatural, without something special, something more than just human. <laughs> if I can put it that way. There is a supernatural side to this. And that's what he says. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, Brother Hagin used to say. And Pastor even says it here. He mentioned it last week. That, faint, that phrase, there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Shun just means to reject. I reject that. And I'll accept the free gift of salvation and I will go to heaven. And what's the evidence? His word. I believe his word in other areas, right? I experience healing in my body. I experience joy in my heart, peace in my head. So I can believe him for all these other things. How come people doubt him when they, when they get all caught up? Am I really going to die and go to heaven? Is this thing for real? You know for a fact it is because of all the other stuff that's happened in your life. I'm not depressed. I'm not, you know, hooked on drugs. I'm not bent out of shape and mentally or whatever. I can see the results of it, the fruit of it in my life. And if I could see the fruit of that stuff, I know for a fact everything else that Jesus said is true. 
aside from the miracles that he performed, aside from the fact that he rose from the dead. Again, it's, it's faith. It's simply acting on what you believe, but there has to be belief. And if you believe it, you'll act on it. And faith calls those things that be not as though they are. And when you do that, they manifest into being. So we begin to see things that we've called into being by our faith. And then we know for a fact everything else that he said must be true. Because I believed what he said and it did something in my life. So I can believe him when he says, well, as soon as you lay your eyes down and sleep, quote unquote, in death, you'll be with me. I can believe that. I can trust that. I can rely on that. I don't have to wonder what's going to happen to me when I die. I know for a fact what's going to happen to me. I'm going to spend eternity with him. Quickly through two more scriptures. Psalm 139, verse 13. Psalm 139, verse 13. I've shared this before, the, the Psalm 119 is the exact middle of the Bible. So if ever somebody says, go to Psalm so-and-so, just kind of look at the middle of the Bible and then flip to wherever they say. Psalm 139, verse 13. It says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. God has a plan for each and every single one of us to accomplish. Verse 16, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. See, there's, there's a plan of God that we have to walk out and that it's up to us to fulfill that plan or not. The age-old example, we talk about gifts and callings. Gifts have to be opened, like a present on Christmas morning. Calls have to be answered, like a telephone call. If you have a Christmas present under the tree one year and then you let it sit until July, you never open it, you're never going to experience the blessings of that present. It's just going to sit there. The same thing with a calling. If, if God's calling you, so to speak, and I believe he calls every single person to do something, that's what he's just said here, every day of my life was recorded in your book. They haven't lived yet. How is it recorded? It's because God has foreknowledge of the future. That's all that that means. That's not God predestinating people to heaven or to hell. God knows the future. He sees us before we're born. He's given us the call, so to speak. It's up, for, it's up to us to answer that call. You've got to pick up the phone, slide the little thing from red to green, and say, hello. <laughs> we have to accept the call. We have to abide with what he says. One last scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11. One of the most famous scriptures in the, in the Bible. Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah 29, 11. I heard a, a quote from a minister named Tony Evans, and I thought it would bear repeating here. I thought it was really good. It's, he said, don't go searching for your destiny. Go searching for your God. Don't go searching for your destiny. Go searching for your God. I enjoyed that. I thought that was good. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. See, people, they get hung up on this sometimes. And they think, well, God, if everything is recorded already, then why do I bother doing anything? You know, if you've got tragedy and evil stuff planned for me, then why do I bother? This verse gives us the key. He is not planning tragedy. He's not planning evil for us. So if we experience those things in our life, there is a disconnect somewhere. And it's not on God's end. He says here, 
I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans, this is key, that second phrase is key. They are plans for good and not for disaster. So if it's not good or disaster, it's not God. It's not a part of his plan. The devil coming into the human race and wrecking havoc was not God's original plan. So when we talk about predestination, God did not choose for Lucifer to become Satan. That was his choice. And people say, well, who created evil? Evil is not an entity. It's not like a thing. It is a choice. The same way that faith is not a thing. Faith is an action. Faith is a choice. Same thing as, as evil, as sin. We have to get it out of our preconceived notions, you know, speaking generally to the church as a whole, I guess. Sin is not, a, is not an ethereal thing. It's just an action. The same way that faith is an act. So where did evil come from? Evil is a choice. The devil simply made a choice. I will choose to rebel. I want a throne that's going to be higher than God's because I see that the people worship him, that the angels, I mean, rather, they worship him. And he, and he says things and they happen. I want that power for myself. So out of all that he saw, he, he worked himself up to this point where I'm going to choose to rebel against God. That's evil. It was not some foreign entity that entered the angelic race. <laughs> And transformed him somehow from Lucifer to Satan. It was a simple choice. All of a sudden, he just he just chose. I want to rebel, and that choice, for lack of a better phrase, devolved him, regressed him, caused him to to shrink, to shrivel, to die. His sin had consequences. His action brought about judgment. And that's the way it's always worked. It's not like sin and judgment entered into humanity when the Old Testament was written. It's always been that way. Just like you brought up. If there is going to be evil present, judgment is going to come. <laughs> it's who God is. He cannot coexist with unholiness. So when the devil made a choice, all of a sudden, like a computer system, you know, malware detected, okay, delete. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not, it wasn't God being unmerciful or whatever. The devil made a choice. And for lack of a better phrase, lack of terminology, whatever, the computer system of heaven saw that there was a virus and just, boop, goodbye. That's the way that it works. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. So if it's not good, it's disaster, it's not God. If it's a future and a hope, part of that first term, a future, it's, it's a, it carries with it good things. A future, not just aimless wandering, living a life, working a nine to five with no purpose. You have a future, you have a purpose, you have a hope. That's his plan for us. And it, again, it's not necessarily to have a, a pulpit ministry for every person. I believe there is gifts and callings for every single human being. We have to answer that call. We have to fulfill that that gift. And when we do that, then we please Him, then we act in faith, then we are going to be able to stand in front of Him one day, and He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You did what I asked you to do. Amen? Amen. Don't go searching for your destiny. Go searching for your God. Don't get all caught up with the, the, the stuff that we go through in the here and now. That's the temptation, and that's where the devil wrangles people. That's where he trips people up. They get their eyes off of God, off of eternity, off of the fact that this is not all there is. And we focus on the here, the now, me, pain, anger, because that's what I'm feeling in the moment. We cannot afford to, to do that. Excuse me. We must see with the eyes of faith beyond this that we're living right now. Realize that there is more, more for us that God has in store. God wants us to do something with our lives. Not just to work a nine to five and, and do you know whatever we want to do. There is a time for recreation. You know you want to hear my opinion. This is just my opinion. Five seconds. I believe there's going to be video games in heaven. <laughs> there's a lot. There's a whole generation that loves video games. Just the same way that there was a whole generation, you know, of of people that loved, yeah, whatever. Exactly. 
There's going to be some amazing board games in heaven. Can you imagine Mousetrap, but you are the mouse? And when you get caught, it's just game over. There's no, like, penalty. There's not a mouse going to eat you. You know, not a cat going to come and eat you or something. Or, like, Candyland, but we live in Candyland for real. Like, you just, you could do whatever you want. <laughs> you know, there's going to be so much to enjoy. He has so much in store for us. And again, it's not just for us to, to sit and do nothing with. I believe there is a place for recreation. But it's, it's all coming from a place of us enjoying God and God enjoying us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for blessing us and keeping us and helping us in all that we do. Father, just thank you for revelation tonight of your word, first and foremost. Thank you for building us up, encouraging us, and helping us to see more clearly with the eyes of faith. Thank you, Lord, for just, in, just everything that you do for us, Lord. Father, we just pray a special blessing tonight on those who are here and those who are watching online. We thank you just for watching over us, keeping us, especially now during the snowstorms that we've been going through. Thank you that you are watching over us. You're protecting us as we travel. If we need to travel, you're protecting our homes, our assets, anything that's ours, any property that, that belongs to us, our family members. Thank you that we are all under your watch, under your care. Lord, we just thank you for a great rest of the night. We praise you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you so much for watching, everybody out there. God bless you. We will see you again next time. Next time is Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for our regular Sunday morning service. Wednesday night, we're starting the book of Ephesians, I believe. And next Friday, we'll be back again for, for Bible study slash youth group. All right? Have a great night. We love you.